A very good evening to you and a warm welcome to your favorite mixed bag energy sector program, which comes to you every Monday at this time on Asasi Radio 99.5 and also streaming live on our Facebook page. My name is Imano Abwaji Riafi. The program is Energy 101. Well, so tonight on Energy 101, Nuclear Power Ghana, the project organization set up to manage Ghana's nuclear power project, says it has finally settled on a preferred and backup site where Ghana's nuclear power plant will be located. But despite this remarkable feat, is Ghana at the crossroads when it comes to choosing a particular technology for its nuclear power development? Tonight, my guest, who is the director of the Nuclear Power Institute, Professor Seth Debra, will be telling us more about this latest development. Don't go away. Also live on Energy 101 with me, Emmanuel Abouaji Riafi. Now, Nuclear Power Ghana, NPG, the project organization set up to manage Ghana's nuclear power project, says it has finally settled on a preferred and backup site to establish Ghana's nuclear power plant. President Akufuado has acknowledged the fact that nuclear is an option for Ghana in the country's electricity mix. In an interview with us, as, with us as a business on the sidelines of a forum on Ghana's nuclear power program, the director of the Nuclear Power Institute, Professor Seth Deborah, highlighted, that, uh, highlighted what went into the selection of the preferred size for the construction. So the process starts with a nationwide search for, let's say, a location to site the nuclear power plant. Uh, that search yielded about 12 different areas, not sites, but areas, uh, based on 10 thematic areas. So I'm talking about hydrology, I'm talking about seismology, I'm talking about density uh, or the population density of the area and some others. Uh, water source was one of those uh, thematic areas. And then it was reduced using exclusionary criteria to four areas. Now, out of that four areas, we sunk boreholes, we did some seismic testing, we did some hydrology tests, we did soil tests, uh, compactness of the soil, everything over there using the boreholes that we've done. And we got some data. So, out of that data, we ranked and came out with the preferred site for the first nuclear power plant and a backup site in case anything happens for the preferred site. So that's how come we came to the to the arrival of the preferred site for the nuclear power plant. Without a site, I mean, I don't know how you are going to build a nuclear power plant. So having the site actually ground us or put us in a very good position to say, hey, Guys, we have a site that we can actually site a nuclear power plant. But just to be to be fair, all the four sites are adequate to actually house a nuclear power plant. But we out of it, there's always a priority based on whatever data that we have. So finally, we have a site that we can actually site a nuclear power plant. And that's very instructive for, for the program. Now, the forum, which was under the theme Learning from the Japanese Nuclear Experience, was organized by the Ghana Nuclear Power Program Organization and the Nuclear Power Ghana in collaboration with the International Cooperation Center Japan. Professor Deborah underscores the importance of selecting a vendor partner for the establishment of the power plant. Now we are looking for a partner to now build a nuclear power plant. And that's what I was talking about. It's a hundred year and over relationship with a country. And you always want to look at the country and project how far that country can take you. A typical example is what is happening in Russia and Ukraine right now. So the Ukraine reactors were built by Russians. So that's one of the irony of this whole uh, fight between Ukraine and Russia, because these plants were built by them. And you don't want a friend now and an enemy later. So you need to take your time in selection and selecting of the partner that will take you not just now, but also beyond the life of the power plant into the decommissioning of the plant, in training of the people, in transferring the... Professor said Debra is the director, Nuclear Power Institute. Well, I was so privileged tonight to have Professor Deborah, Deborah right here in our studios at Asasi Radio. Uh, he will be telling us more about the current state of the country's quest to establish a nuclear power plant and who is partnering Ghana and the way forward. Prof, good evening and welcome to Energy 101. Good evening, Mr. Riafi. It's good to be here. Mm, I appreciate your time. I know you have a very you know, a heavy schedule, but you made time tonight to be in our studios. So once again, welcome. Thank you very much. Well, so I want to first start by asking, do you think that Ghana is at crossroads uh, on the choice of technology for the proposed uh, nuclear power plant, or the NPP, as it were? Uh, I'm asking this because we've been associated in the past with the Russians. Uh, you brought in last week the Japanese for us to learn, and we're also hearing that the Russians are also lurking around somewhere. W who is involved? Are, are we at crossroads here? 
Thank you very much, Mr. Yofi. And let me commend the uh, management of us as a radio. I mean, you, I think you have a beautiful oh. studio. Thank you. Um, this is my first time here. I'm very impressed. Um, again, let me start by saying this, because if I don't say it, I don't know when I'm going to get a chance to say this. But Gaia Ghana Atomic Energy Commission will be celebrating its 60th anniversary okay. next year. So okay. it's also very instructive uh, to put into perspective what the commission has done over the years. But greetings from my minister, uh, Dr. Wepo mm. and my director general, uh, Professor Abwache Dampare. I think I'll give you another time one day yes. to tell us about all that they can It's Ghana very important. Exactly. It's very sure. important. And the uh, um, ED, the executive director, okay. uh, that's uh, Dr. Stephen Yamwa of sure. NPG. Now, Ghana is not at a crossroads. Ghana is at a point of making a decision. If I, I want to put it at crossroads, it means maybe we are a bit confused. We don't know where we are going. Mm. Okay. I believe we know where exactly where we are going. What Ghana is doing is we are associating ourselves with all the advanced nuclear, co- nuclear countries. So you mentioned Russia. You mentioned China. Mm. You mentioned the U.S. You mentioned India. You mentioned South Korea. You mentioned France. So we have an agreement, a cooperation agreement with all the advanced countries. Now this puts Ghana in a very peculiar position to pick the best out of these countries. Would that not rather give you a tough I mean, decision to make by so, selecting one? Yeah, that is true. It's a, it's a tough decision to make, but again, it gives you a good perspective of what's out there and what each and every one of these countries are off- is offering. And then you can pick the, the best one out of it. And there's one interesting thing. NPG has placed itself such that it's communicating with the vendor countries and letting them know, guys, we are talking to each and every one of you. So we are not just talking to one person or one uh, company or one uh, country, no. We are talking to everybody mm. and letting them know we are talking to their, your other competitors. Okay. So you better uh, so give us something. What will be the key requirements uh, to make a choice uh, of, of that uh, particular technology? To mm. One of the key requirements will be financing. How would the finance look like? Because currently, and I heard from Konobo uh, Japan, the Deputy Minister of Energy, saying that government is not giving sovereign guarantee, it's not going to PCOA, it's not giving anything in terms mm. of guarantees. So what entity will come in and either use its own money or use investors' money to build a power plant? Is that feasible? Together? It's very feasible. It's been done before and it can be done again. It's been done in Turkey and it can be done again. How will that. they recover the money afterwards? So recovery of money is by sale of electricity. So you sell the electricity, and we are not just talking about 20 years, 25 years of selling electricity. We are talking about 80 years of selling electricity. So you are not in, in a fix, when am I going to recover my money? The recovery of the money goes over some time. But again, you recover everything and still make profit at the end of the day. So it's, it's quite a lucrative um, sector. It's quite a lucrative um, investment entity that people will be interested in mm-hmm. actually investing in. Mm. Uh, and what is the current state of our transmission grid, and why is it so necessary that you know we include nuclear uh, in future? Our transmission grid, I, I would say, is one of the most stable in the West African region. Uh, I'm not talking about distribution, okay. so I will just stay with transmission. Transmission mm. is very strong, it's very good, but again, it needs a dense energy source that will keep it as the base load. We all know the situation with Akosombo. We know the role Akosombo has played in the implementation or in the undertaking of our energy uh, um, requirements in this mm. country and even in the West African region or even in an industrialization drive. But as we go on, as climate change issues, as climate variability sets in, we need another energy source that is dense enough to be that base load together with Akosombo to be able to drive the industrialization aspect of this country. What about, you know, talking about affordability, comparing hydro and nuclear? Which one is more affordable and why are we going for um, nuclear? So you will not get any form of affordability close to hydro. And that's the fact because it's a renewable resource. Mm. If not for climate change, I mean, this is one of the most or the most cheapest source of energy. 
that you will get. Unfortunately, we are moving away from that because of climate change issues, because of energy mix mm. and all those things, and because of the sustainability of the grid or of the energy mix. So we need another source of energy. And that's how come we are doing that dense energy source, and that is uh, nuclear. We are not focusing much on the uh, hydros. Why? Because Ghana has already exploited about 68% of its hydro resources. I don't know which dam, which river again you are going to dam, either you are going to dam the Pra or Agobra or what. But you look at the other dams or other resources that are left for the hydro, and you will see that they are about 50 megawatts, 90 megawatts. And without irrigation, this 90 megawatt, 50 megawatt doesn't even make economic sense to actually build the dam. So we need another diversification, and that is where hydro, uh, sorry, nuclear actually mm-hmm. comes in. Right. Now, l- let's kind of try to you know, trace the path along which we've come. I know we've gone through some I mean, phase one already, and I don't know the stage that we are in now, whether we're almost through the phase two. Can you enlighten us a bit how far we have come? So the nuclear program is, is unique in its, in its own sense. And it's a three-phase approach. This three-phase approach was established by the International Atomic Energy Agency for countries like Ghana, newcomer countries, to follow. So there's a phase one where you prepare yourself to make a commitment to a nuclear power project. So all that you are doing is you are having desktop studies. Do I have a site? Do I have water for cooling? Do I have the necessary infrastructure to support safety? Do I have the legal requirement? Do I have the regulatory requirement? My, that's my law, allow procurement and all those. So you go through all these and say, okay, this thing is for me, so I'll go ahead. And this thing is not for me. I don't think I'm going to go ahead. And that's the phase one. And so we've, we've cleared ahead of Ghana has actually done or gone ahead or finished phase one. So we've cleared phase one, and Ghana is considered a phase two country on the international scene. Mm. In the phase two, what we are doing is we are looking for a partner to sign what we call a contract based on a bid, the bid invitation specification. specification. So we will then go through that process and get a contract with a vendor or a vendor country, a vendor company. And then phase three is the construction of the plant. So Ghana is currently looking for a partner and Mm -hmm. a technology from that partner or from a different partner to now go ahead sign the contract, and then in the phase three, build a good plan. Do we have any idea of the kind of technology we would require? I mean, since there are many of them, various countries, do we know exactly what particular technology and what it would do for us I- in the energy sector? Technology choice shouldn't be much of a challenge because your two main technologies that are being used around the world is a boiling water reactor and a pressurized water reactor. Just a bit of a difference. So with boiling water reactors, we allow the water within the central part of the system to boil. And then as it boils, it gives off uh, steam. It's like you putting um, water on the kettle and boiling, allowing the steam. And then we just trap the steam into a steam generator and use it to drive a turbine. Mm. Now, with the pressurized water reactor, we don't allow the system to boil. We pressurize it at a very high pressure, about 17, 17, 17 megapascal. And then we drive that hot water around a steam turbine, sorry, a steam generator, and then it generates steam, and then we use it to drive a turbine. So these are the two main ones. The ones that are mostly used around the world is the pressurized water reactor. And that's a system that we are looking to actually procure. Mm. Now, one very important thing that people are not so comfortable with when it, it comes to the issue of you know, um, nuclear is radioactive materials and the fact that it could be very injurious to humans. And they always mention the prominent ones, uh, the ones that happened in Chernobyl and other ones uh, in other countries. And uh, so they are scared. I know that you've selected a site. Uh, have you taken into consideration these? People are saying that we're a small country. Even the bigger ones like Japan could not you know, man- I mean, handle it. What about Ghana? Thank you. So, nuclear has grown over the years, and it has learned from mistakes. So, we have generations of nuclear power plants. What you um, talked about, the Japan experience, or the, um, let me go as, back as, uh, as far back as 
Chernobyl or Trima Island. These are the three major accidents that we all know. Okay. But even I can isolate the Fukushima, I'm not here for the technical aspect. Mm. But let's talk about the Fukushima, the Trima Island, and the Chernobyl. Chernobyl, Chernobyl was a generation two reactor. What, what, what is that? Uh, so the generation one reactors are what you call proof of concept. So they were small reactors, 15 megawatts, just to try and see if this will actually work. Okay. All generation one reactors are out of the system. The one, the last one was in uh, was in the UK and it was decommissioned just in 2012. What was in Chernobyl was a generation two. So they learned from the experience of generation one and then built generation two something much bigger and incorporated the safety, some safety limits within it. It wasn't enough. Now we moved on to generation three and now at even generation three plus where we are or we have what we call passive safety systems, such that if even the person is not in the control room to control the reactor, the reactor has the ability to shut down on its own. Automatically. So there's an example. With the small reactor that we have at the Ghana Atomic Energy Commission, right. the, there is a difference between the inlet and the outlet temperature. I mean, where the water comes in from to cool the plant, mm. it's called the inlet. Now, when the water leaves out, it's called the outlet. When the difference between the inlet and the outlet is beyond 10 degrees C, the reactor will shut down its own. You don't have to do anything about it. So we've incorporated more safety features into the reactor to make sure that it is safe. And then with these big reactors, there are what you call um, reserve tanks. Let me call it that way. Or even um, centrifugal pumps that are dedicated just in case anything happens to bring in water for cooling. And that's what you need most within an accident situation or with an accident situation. You need more water to cool down the plant so that you reduce the heat. Mm. Now, the issue of radiation and the issue of nuclear, nuclear by its definition, it just it means the central part. And every human being is made up of atoms. An atom is made up of uh, nucleus, mm. which is basically mm. protons and neutrons. And every human being has these in your body, whether we like it or not. It's part of us. So technically, mm. we are a nuclear or we are a radiative source, for lack of a better expression, okay. as a human being. So we are not prevented or no... So it's, it's something that's actually in nature. Now, when you look at banana, and I'm not saying this to scare anybody. Okay. Banana is very good. Cassava is very good. But it has a stable radioactive in there, potassium-40, which is very good for your body. And around the world, we have what's called background radiation, which is already with us. So, and when even you fly from Ghana to, let's say, UK, the amount of radiation that you receive is even more than me working in a nuclear power plant. Wow. So there are issues that we have not brought out yet that we need to discuss. We live under the sun, which is actually a radioactive area. The sun emits cosmic radiations. It emits seven lights. And all these lights, we use them. And we benefit from them. All we are saying is that let's move from that benefit that we have in health and great industry mm. and let's just use it for power purposes. So, so despite uh, these buffers and these, you know, um, like ba backups that you're talking about, in case the, the plant still, you know, has an emergency, uh, doesn't it have the power to destroy the immediate communities and beyond? So I, I guess you are talking about a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly so. Yeah. But there is the issue. The nuclear power plant cannot be used as a bomb. It's for a very good purpose that is designed how it's designed. Okay. It's designed with how control rod. It's designed with what you call defense in depth. So with the current power plant, if even it goes to a point where the, the reactor or the core or the heating source is getting melted, like what happened in Chernobyl, there is an encapsulation of that melting core, of that melting heating source. And it is encapsulated so that you don't have a release of radioactivity. 
So that's how far we have gotten as the nuclear industry. And that's how serious and safety conscious mm. we are. Are we going to go for a small modular reactor or the very big one? That will be at the um, discretion of, number one, the president, and number two, the Minister of Energy, with the support of the Minister of Environment, Science, Technology. The reason why I'm saying this is we started this program with the idea of having a large reactor. Okay. But as we went on, the concept of small modular reactors started coming into play. So what we did was, as a wise country, as wise technical people, we decided let's also consider this. So we are considering the two. And we are putting the pros and the cons before the minister and the president to make a decision based on the technical advice that we, we give. Mm. So me sitting here, I won't say we are going small or we are going large. Currently, um, cabinet has given approval to look at the two and then make a decision with going forward. Mm. Now, one other controversial question I've always been asking you. Um, we know that the facility should be closer to water body, a yes. large one, of course. Yes. So I'm um, either conjecturing whether it should be by the sea or by a river body. But where exactly have you identified? Because you say you've now found two sites, uh, the main site and a backup site. Where will it be located? So let me answer your question this way, because um, my salary is not that big, but I still want to keep it. So this question is actually beyond my salary. The I will say that it's close to a water body, a large water body. And the sea? It will be close to the sea. Okay. It will be close to areas that is sparsely populated. But where exactly it is, see, we have a tendency in this country to actually raise the cost of projects. And that's what we don't want to do. People like me who don't have much, uh, or, or people like others who have so much, can easily buy lands within the area. And by the time you are ready to actually make a decision or go to site, you have people already occupying the site. We have one currently on the um, Achimota um, stretch, Achimota and some stretch, where people were paid compensation, and we have to find a way to inject them. Even though okay. they were paid, they didn't move because we didn't use the land in terms of the road that was being constructed as at that time during the uh, former president Kufo's time. And now we are to expand these people are still there. So there's a tendency for people to move into areas where they sense that there are projects coming. And that's mm -hmm. why we are taking our time for the president himself to announce. And by the time he announced, we would have already acquired the site and acquired the, the various uh, documentation. Uh, have you been interacting with residents of that area since you've for, made um, for over two years now we've been interacting with the residents of the area but you don't tell them you didn't tell them that this oh we we uh, see it's it's our duty to make sure that they know what is coming and educate them okay so when you go to that place unfortunately you may not be able to go there i but wish i could <laughs> i'll go if you invite me i'll go and see when you go to those places mm. they will tell you that we want this project here and they will tell you the benefits and possible it's a big possible impact of that project when it mm. comes, both economic and in case it goes off, like you are saying. Mm. So they know the, the, the pros and the cons of the project, but they will tell you we want this project here because of its economic um, benefits. Of, of, of it. And so you, you are confidently saying that nuclear technology or nuclear power technology is not risky. Should, I, should we say it? Okay, so it's not risky because safety is taken care of. There is what we call zero margin for error when it comes to nuclear development, the design and its implementation. Mm -hmm. There are over 400 nuclear power plants operating around this world. Over 400. And over 50 have been built elsewhere. And, and since the Chernobyl era, we've not had any serious so, accidents. So we've had the Chernobyl, we've had the Three Mile Island, yeah. and we've had the Fukushima, which I say I can actually go into the technicalities of it, but again, it's not, it's not, it's not, it, that's not the focus of this. Mm. But so we've had, let's say, three major accidents from the 1950s till now, and still new, new nuclear power plants are being built around the world. Mm. We don't have much time, it's almost time, but uh, quickly, what is the sustainability level of uh, nuclear power and how supportive is it to industrialization? Oh, now that, that's, that's a very deep question. Mm. 
when it comes to industrialization nuclear has a peculiar role to play number one its availability factor is 90 percent it tells you that 90 percent of the year this power plant is online okay when it talks about sustainability it operates between 18 to 24 months before you shut down for one month to change one third of the fuel and do some maintenance so technically that's it nuclear fuel is used to power only nuclear power plants it's not like gas it's not like crude or it's not like um heavy fuel oil that used in industry so it's used for only nuclear power plants so you can have series of reloads on site for the next six years and still project very good electricity now once you have stable power you have affordable power you have clean power then industries actually build around these things because they can actually project the cost of electricity for over five years and then bring industrialization to the area and it happened in Arco in the US where a first nuclear power plant was built and whole communities mm. set up around it and I employ you recently four nuclear power plants have been built in the UAE I know people are saying hey let's do renewables which is very very good okay. but renewables cannot thrive on this one renewable you need a very good base load to actually operate Mm. People are saying, hey, let's look at places like Germany. They are doing very good renewables. But what the Germans don't tell us is that they build the renewables based on coal. So they have a very good base load mm. in terms of coal. And they are building the renewables on top. And that's what we need to do. We need to have a very good base load in terms of nuclear and then build our renewables on top. Right, thank you so much, Prof. Uh, it's thank so you. exciting talking to you because uh, you've broken down the issues and I really wish we could do a part two of this so that we learn more about nuclear power technology. But uh, once again, thank you for coming to our studios and we hope uh, you come again where we give you the invitation. Thank you My very guest much. has been Professor uh, Seth Debra. He's the director, Nuclear Power Institute. We've been talking about the state of Ghana's nuclear power plant. My name is Imano Abwaji. We are Let's meet again same time next week for more interesting developments in the world of energy. Have a good evening.